Hey everyone, this is Carlos. I'm the CEO at Product School. Today I'm here with Scott Salkin, who is the CMO at Gainsight. Welcome to the show. Awesome. Thanks, Carlos. Excited to be here. Scott, six years and a half at Gainsight. Um, that's quite a long time. Uh, yes. Especially you. <laughs> your company comes to mind as I think about you know one of the premier B2B SaaS platforms specifically around customer success. Yeah. So I'm very curious to know what was customer success like? 6.5 years ago. Oh man, yeah. So, you know, I joined Gainsight after um, after actually running and building my own SaaS company, and you know, customer success was still kind of in its you know early early growth stage and just kind of you know starting to be adopted. And six and a half years ago, I think people thought of customer success as um, you know something you put in place with customer success managers to go and handhold your company, your, your customers with more kind of like a white glove experience and, you know, automate some tasks and try and drive as much efficiency into it and, you know, build some playbooks and try and get really good health scores and get a good view of the customer and just kind of, you know, it was, it was kind of a standardized thing. And, and, um, and Gainsight, of course, kind of led the way in that, um, you know, Salesforce really, I think, you know, can be credited with coining the term customer success. The gain side really kind of took the baton and ran with it in terms of building, you know, purpose-built software, building a community, um, and uh, and really kind of, you know, building out what I would say is, you know, not only, a, a, you know, became a software category, you know, it was one of the only real new categories built, I would say, in the last, you know, 15, 10, 15 years or so that really blew up to what it is. It became a category, it became a profession, and it also became a department. So really interesting to see how customer success evolved into just like this concept idea into, you know, you don't start a SaaS company these days without sales, marketing product, and now customer success. So yeah, that's where it is. Yeah. It, it reminds me of my own story as I saw in product, right? Like there was no yeah. function uh, when I started and now obviously they're chief product officers, but there's also chief uh, customer officer, right? Chief customer officers. Yeah. 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 I mean, chief customer officers came about, you know, and, and, um, and, you know, I think these days you see, you know, not only CEOs really taking a, a really key primary role in, in driving customer success, but also CROs. You know, I mean, you look at the two key metrics that are around customer success, net retention and gross retention. Um, you know, gross retention is oftentimes tied more to the CCO, but net retention is driven, you know, driving new revenue. And there's still a lot of companies that drive that through the, the office of the CRO too. Because when I think about customer, even before customer success, uh, it was customer support, right? And that was supposed yeah. to be a, a cost center. Uh, yeah. As customer success became more strategic and a, and a revenue generator, it became part of what's called the GTM suite with, with yeah. sales and, and marketing as a whole. And, and those two key metrics that you mentioned, like what net retention and then what's the other one? Gross retention. Gross retention. Like, can you yeah. tell us a little bit more about what those mean? Yeah, you know, I mean, it's you kind of look at it as a, um, as you know, there, there, there's, there's different areas of retention. You know, I think companies start a lot with just logo retention. They want to retain the logos that they're going and closing, and just keeping customers is in, incredibly important. You know, as they as they evolve and, and and start to grow, you get more into gross retention, which is you know keeping the dollars that you have in the business, and so keeping those dollars there. How much of that? Uh, of that, you know, recurring revenue are you actually keeping? And then you get into net retention. Net retention is really more about growth. So are you growing the revenue? So, you know, net retention, companies want to see that typically over 100%. That means that you're growing your customer base. And so that's probably one of the most important metrics you have out there in terms of showing the ability to have a healthy company when you're in recurring revenue. Because if you're growing those customers, selling them more, whether it's more product, more seats, um, uh, you know, you're acquiring companies and selling them additional tools and resources. Um, that's what's driving up net retention. So that's um, that's kind of become the the north star for a lot of companies, especially today when everything's about efficiency and keeping your customers. It's harder to close new business. Um, net retention has really become kind of a, a, a key metric for for executive teams in the C-suite as well as for uh, for um, investors. So basically, when that number is about a hundred percent, that means that you are not only retaining that account, but you are also expanding it. Yeah, you're expanding the account. So, you know, the top performing, even public companies out there, a lot of them you see with net retention. Um, you know, the folks who have managed to IPO over the year, the last several years were in a tough market. And, and the ones who did so in, you know, 2020, 2021, you know, they had net retention, most of them, you know, up in the teens, you know, the teens. So about, you know, 110, 120. You know, you look at companies like, you know, Snowflake, who um, takes a little bit of a different approach to customer success, but 
um, but uh, but still has you know a lot of customer success functions in the business that we can talk about. Um, you know, they're up in the one twenties, I think, typically. So, what are the most common uh, orgs structures that you've seen uh, with with customer success? Is either being part of revenue teams and their CRO? Is it that yeah. a separate entity with a CCO? Is it even under product? You know, it's funny. We've done we've we've done a lot of surveys and asked a lot of folks about this. And you know, who owns who owns, for example, the renewal, but who owns the expansion? And a lot of times, it's you know, the renewal typically sits under customer success. The expansion is almost 50, 50, 50. It either sits under um, you know the customer success team or it sits under the sales team. The way we have a structure here, which works really effectively for us, is we actually have expansion sitting under our, our CCO. Um, and so, you know, our CCO owns a part of the bookings number. And so it really creates a good partnership between the CCO and the CRO who are working together to hit your overall booking goal. Um, you know, retention overall. So GRR sits completely with the uh, with, with our CCO. So she owns the customer success team. Um, she also owns what we call a customer account management team. And we split those up. So you've got a customer success team who's really focused on delivering results, showing outcomes to customers. And you have a little bit of a separate team that actually goes in there and works on expanding the customer and growing them into new products, add new modules, things of that nature. And so those both sit in sales. So they're there as well. So if I were to zoom in into a customer success org, what are the different sub-functions that you see there? Um, which I can imagine there's account management, there's customer support. I also see on your website, you have a product that is dedicated to product education. Yeah. So our customer success work, you know, is, is really kind of, you know, broken into a couple of different functions. We have support. So we have our support team um, that, that more handles ticketing and solving problems or solving issues for the customers. We have our services team, which sits under customer success. And services really, you know, again, works on professional services, whether they are, you know, implementation, onboarding, all the way through, you know, really servicing the product to help, you know, improve a customer's usage. We also have our, uh, our customer success team. So again, the folks who are working on a day-to-day -day basis with some of our customers. Um, we have our customer account management team, upselling, cross-selling. And then we actually have a digital customer success team. And the digital team is focused on, you know, I won't call them our long tail of customers, but folks who may be a little bit lower in terms of the ARR side of things and did not elect to have a customer success manager or they're paying for a specific package where we service them completely from a digital, um, a digital method. So, um, you know, they, they do their QBRs digitally, they get their tools and resources digitally, you know, everything they're doing is, um, is managed from a, from a digital perspective to drive more efficiency in the business. So as you think about the relationship between the product team and, and customer success team, especially if they are not yeah. under the same function, what are some of the best practices? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, it, you know, we actually, um, gosh, what is it now about five, five and a half years ago, acquired a company called Aptrinsic. Um, which um, which uh, we then turned into called Gainsight PX, and Gainsight PX, uh, you know, is a is a tool where you could add in uh, product analytics. Um, uh, you could drive user engagements, in-app engagements. Uh, it's got something called a KC bot, a knowledge center bot, so it actually has a bot built in within the tool. Um, you know, we look at product and customer success as needing to be hand in hand. You know, it's really hard to have customer success without user success. Um, you know, at the individual level. So, um, you know, being able to track things like user engagement within the tool, um, you know, which features are being leveraged the best, you know, are your customers sticky? Um, you know, a lot of that comes from within the product. The ability to drive successful outcomes for the customers, um, you know, comes from, comes from that relationship as well. You know, getting feedback in terms of where you're going with the roadmap, um, you know, what features are most valuable, you know, that, that relationship definitely has to be hand in hand. And we, we, we see a lot of the most successful customers who are driving the highest GRR numbers, um, you know, delivering the most, you know, uh, growth for their, for their bookings through their customers. They've got a really strong relationship between, um, between product and customer success. And, and I think that's one of the things that makes your company unique. I, I've seen a lot of uh, companies in the space that target product teams and they usually start from other functions, so maybe marketing or data, they eventually expand it into product as a persona. In your case, yeah. I see you started in customer success and then created or, or acquired this, this product called PX to focus right. specifically on the product team. Yeah, yeah. So, so you know, when we, have, we have different personas that we market to, you know, and so, um, but, you know, it's, it's, um, it's in, we have just found it critically important to bring those two personas together, you know, in terms of even, you know, when we launched our, 
you know, one of the most, I think, you know, the biggest moats or most, the most important, you know, aspects of gain site that sets us apart is our community. And even from the perspective of building our community, one of the bigger focus areas we've had is bringing more customer success and product people together. And, you know, and even for our conference, you know, hey, if you're coming as a CCO, bring your chief product officer with you, your VP of product, whatever that is, to learn together and, you know, attend some of the sessions in unison so that you guys can learn about, you know, how to, how to operate best together. I think it's, you know, super important for those teams to be hand in hand. And then again, you know, we talk about go to market teams, you know, the CRO is really important there too. You know, so whether it's driving new business or driving expansion, that relationship between the CCO, the CRO and the product officer, I think, you know, it's just that, that, that obviously drives the core of the business. So how are you thinking about marketing your own portfolio of products? I look at the website and you yeah. seem to have four, right? The CS, PX, yeah. CC, and CE. Yeah, yeah. So I'll explain those. So we've got CS, customer success management, really our core product where Gainsight started and kind of our, you know, our, our, our bread and butter, you know, where, where we really got our, you know, initial core growth with. Um, PX, product experience. So, you know, in-app engagements, product analytics, everything you can think of. Um, in that space. Um, and then we went and acquired two additional companies over the last about 18, 24 months. One being um, a customer community product, formerly a company called Insighted, um, based out of, originally based out of Amsterdam that we acquired to bring in the community aspect of things. You know, communities we've found to be really critical in terms of driving customer success, getting users to engage together, engaging with your customers in different ways, um, in more of a digital kind of format. And then we acquired uh, a learning management system, which really is a, is a is a customer education platform. So we call it CE, customer education. Um, you know, you bring those four things together. Again, you know, we've seen this shift in SaaS over the last several years where it's not just about all out growth. It's very much focused on efficient growth. And, um, you know, it's not about just adding customer success managers. See, you know, customer success leaders or whoever owns CS can't afford to just add more headcount. They've got to do things in a much more digital way. And so we've seen things start to come together. You know, you see, you know, community platforms and education start to come together. You see companies building more, you know, we re refer to as customer hubs. Um, you know, uh, customers, I think these days, the thing that you notice, they're on all the time, you know, so they're, they're, they're needing access to information where and when they need it. Um, and, and a customer success manager can't always be relied on to provide that. They're not always on um, like a customer is. So, um, and so, you know, having that combination of digital tools with, with kind of a hub type of environment, education to train your customers and give them learning environments for onboarding, um, continued learning, things like that, community where they engage with each other or get product feedback or, um, or, or you know, engage with, with um, in different forums. Um, and then in-app engagements, that have things that happen within the product, all those are critical to being able to grow customer success without it, again, feeling like a cost center, with, with it feeling like it's actually a revenue generating center. And then you've got your tools for your customer success managers and automation and things like that, which is CS. And you still can add workflows, email, automation, things like that into your day-to-day -day to be able to make that more of a digital, digital experience while keeping it very personalized. And so that's where CS comes into play. So you've got those four products. And really, you know, we've now built what I would say is, you know, a architecture where, you know, we've started to now stack things like AI on top of it. So, you know, two things we announced at our, at our Pulse conference just a couple of months ago, um, or a month ago, actually, um, is something called Copilot and another tool called Autopilot. Copilot really being a tool for your teams. And so we look at it in two, this in two different directions. You've got customer success, which is being driven by your team. So customer success managers, folks in your organization, support, things like that that we said. Copilot starting to drive more automation and AI into that using generative and other tools. OpenAI we've got a partnership with, as well as IBM and other folks. And then you've got, uh, then you've got Autopilot, which sits more on top of the customer hub, which is more for your customers. So somewhere where they log in and use the tools. So we actually have tools for them leveraging AI that sit on top of that stack, which is customer facing tools. So things that they log into, a customer themselves is going to log into their community. A customer is going to log into the learning management system. A customer is going to log into your software and see an app engagement. So we want to add AI on top of that layer also. So really being able to kind of stack things on top of those two sides is where a lot of that starts to come together and you start adding even more efficiency for your teams, for your business. And again, it's, it's about not just adding the headcount, not just adding more CSMs. It's about actually, you know, turning them into superheroes or giving them superpowers by, by putting all these digital tools alongside them. And, and how is that affecting your product strategy as you think about these uh, oh, wow. teams becoming yeah. 
more efficient and potentially buying less seeds? I mean, our product strategy, I mean, you look at pretty much any enterprise SaaS company out there, the first thing you see now on their homepage is how they're, how they're delivering with AI. <laughs> so AI is no, really you know, a lot of what we're doing. Yeah, um, no, I agree. I, I, was, I was saying pricing strategy, given oh, that now AI is making all of those teams more, more efficient. Pricing strategy is an interesting one for us too. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, product strategy is very focused on AI. Um, and that goes into some of our pricing strategy too, which I can discuss. But you know, a couple of things around pricing. I would say this, you know, a lot of what we sell still sits in the customer, chief customer officer suite. And so, you know, the CCO's budget isn't necessarily just growing and growing and growing. We're just trying to fit more into their, their bucket oftentimes. And, you know, a lot of the companies, you know, we've gone and acquired, you know, we now have this suite, which is morphing into a platform type of offering, which can help companies drive a lot more efficiency into their stack. But we've got to get creative in terms of how we price that. So doing things like bundling products together is really helpful for us. So, you know, if you bundle customer success with PX, you know, offering discounts along those lines or including PX in some areas, you know, now combining uh, customer communities with customer education and calling it a customer hub, we were able to, to blend those things together to be able to create one suite or one offering where you can actually build a... Um, a centralized place to use those two tools together. So yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely impacted us. And we're trying to find, you know, when you acquire companies, one thing you realize is that they're not all, they don't all have the same pricing strategy. And so, you know, we want to be able to do things like add similar levers to each one. So for example, you know, a customer record could be a lever and, uh, or a user could be a lever. Um, you know, you see a lot of folks kind of moving away from the user perspective, but how can we, you know, make those feel as similar as possible for, for, for our customers and our prospects? So they don't feel like you buy this tool over here and you're basing you're basing on user records. You buy this tool over here and you're basing on customer records. You buy this tool over here and you're basing on number of learners. We want that all to be very similar. So that's how it's really impacted our our pricing. And then you, and then you factor in AI. You know, we've still seen a lot of companies trying to figure out how they price AI. You see Salesforce with you know adding additional pricing for Einstein and then for yep. um, you know they're using credits, so credits and things of that nature to be able to actually use the AI. You know. I think we're, you know, we have a perspective that eventually, you know, AI is going to, AI is going to become, you know, commonplace. It's also, it's, it's, it's table stakes. You've got to include it. So, you know, a lot of the AI features that we started with, we're actually including within our platform to give to our customers because at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's about driving more bookings, but it's as much about driving more stickiness and competitive differentiation. And so we want our customers to use our AI. We don't want to put as many roadblocks in front of them. You know, we want it to be adopted. We want feedback and we'll see where that ends up going in the future. But, you know, when it comes to AI, which is which I still I think is I mean, I, I have conversations all the time with folks around how they're how they're doing this. You know, it's 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 a tricky scenario. But I think, you know, uh, us, you know, putting it in front of customers and, and getting them to use it has been has been a win for us. I, I see that I definitely hope that that's the long term strategy for the winning companies yeah. because ultimately it's encouraging the users to get as much value as possible and not be penalized right. for it. Right. Not be penalized, get the most out of it you possibly can. You know, things things may shift. You know, I don't know if AI, if every AI feature will be free. I think a lot of components will need to be included within within the software that, you know, it's it's gonna it's gonna, you know, just just again be expected. You know, and the other thing is the cost, the cogs you know, of AI are, are coming down, you know, it, it started high, just like most new technology and it's kind of dropping. And I think we'll see it continue to drop as time goes. And that makes it easier for companies to include it within their products. So that's one thing that you have to take into consideration. And there's always the, the, the you know, you've got to weigh, you know, you've got to weigh out, Hey, listen, is this new product or is this new AI feature or whatever you build, you know, is the impact on new booking going to, uh, you know, offset, I guess, what the potential increase in GRR could be for the company. If you're actually driving more GRR and keeping more customers as a result of a feature like AI, that could outweigh the new bookings you can get from the new feature. So you've got to look at those two things. We take a lot of those things into account. And then in, in terms of um, expansion of an account, let's say your customer starts with one of your products, let's say product experience. Yeah. And there's obviously the option to get more gain side products, but there might yeah. be also situations where the user already has 
addition, uh, another product, right? So how do you think about integrations as a way to also not penalize the user for making different choices? Yeah, I think, you know, for companies that really want to be a true platform, you've got to open up your own tool set to integrate with other tools, you know? And so, you know, if you have Gainsight CS, you can still integrate with other tools that are out there that shall remain nameless, but you can, you can integrate with other tools that are out there. And you've got to be able to, to, to allow folks to do that, whether it's CS that integrates with other product tools, whether it's PX that integrates with other CS platforms, you know, you've got to, if you're really going to be a platform of yourself and not just a point product with a closed environment, You've got to be able to open up your your you know your APIs and, and your tool set to be able to let folks build on top of it, um, and I think that that goes to be a part as as part of being an ecosystem. It's you know it's it's co-opetition. I think you know it's you know sure there's there's competition out there, but you've got to be cooperative with them in some ways. And you see that with some of the biggest SaaS players out there. You see it with you know Salesforce integrating with uh, with HubSpot. You see it with Zendesk integrating with Salesforce. You see it with a lot of companies out there who actually have been really successful building platforms, building ecosystems. They've done it by opening up their, their technology to let folks build on top of it. So I think you've got to be able to yeah. do that. I agree. And to me, the, you know, the, the key to elevate, the, from expand from being a platform into an ecosystem is not only to allow the integrations with other third-party players, but even enable businesses on top of yours. And have yeah, like, a, then you go say for us like a marketplace. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you go from, and that and that's where you go from ecosystem to economy. You know, you go to actually building an economy. I mean, um, you know, that is what Salesforce has done. You know, you see other companies, ServiceNow, some other ones that are out there who have done very similar things in terms of they've not just built, you know, a platform. They then built an ecosystem, which then turned into they built really a running economy on the Salesforce platform. Which is which is incredible the way they built that out. You know, millions and um, you know tens of millions, if not more, uh, running through that ecosystem to um, um, to be able to, to to actually build businesses. I mean, there are companies that have started people who have gotten. You know, I would say you know I wouldn't even know the number of people that you know are employed these days because companies have built on the Salesforce ecosystem. So it's it's incredible. Uh, well, Scott, it's been a pleasure. To, to chat yeah. with you and learn more about, about how you're thinking about this evolution of CS, the evolution of your own product into a platform and an ecosystem, yeah. and also better ways to collaborate between CS and, and product. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it.